Okay, all right, grab your seat there. Again, we're so glad that you're here today. If you're watching online, hello. If we haven't met, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here at Lakeside. And we do have a message that we're going to jump into that I'm really excited about. But it's kind of interview Sunday uh, because I have one more, one more very important VIP uh, interview to do. But let me set the stage, give a little bit of context. Uh, last week, we had you fill out an annual Easter survey, and so many over 1,000 people uh, filled that out. We found out that at least least 25% of you have been here for less than a year, which is phenomenal. So you might not know about Blitz and you might not know the history. Well, let me just give you a little bit of context because uh, this church was founded 36 years ago uh, with Brad and Donna Franklin. They came here, they started this church. We're pretty excited about that. And then this past September, there was a transition for the first time in 36 years. There was a transition of leadership where Brad had a little baseball and he handed it to me and he said, take the ball throw strikes, you know, all that kind of analogy stuff. It was great. And then uh, we said goodbye for now, goodbye for now to Brad and Donna as they took a break from all of this to just kind of uh, be together, hear from God, learn what it's like to, to live a life and not be lead pastors. And then we knew that Brad and Donna would be back. And so Easter was their back. And you guys, Brad is here. So please welcome to the stage, Brad Franklin, everybody. Come on up. Welcome to Lakeside. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Thank have a you. seat. Have a seat. Morning, everybody. We, we, just wanna, we just want to have an opportunity. I know that he's been in the lobby and some of you, but we just like as a, an entire church, especially for those of you that don't know Brad, uh, to just hear a little bit about our founding pastor and what's going on and what God's been doing, what God's going to do. So, uh, hello, welcome to Lakeside. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to know about those 25%. What took you so long? Uh, there you go. There you go. But welcome. But there welcome. you go. Uh, Brad, when we said goodbye for now, you were going to take a break, and it's been that, those six months. Give us a little glimpse of what life has been like, what you've been learning, all those types of things these past six months. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we, retirement is busy. <laughs> Man, I, I, I donated a body part to science while I was while I've been away. A uh, little surgery there I uh, wasn't expecting. And then we've been traveling a lot. We've been in uh, we've been in Santa Cruz a couple times. We've been in Hawaii. We've been in Utah twice to see our son over there. Uh, then we went down to Arizona after that and uh, went to spring training baseball games. This year, this year instead of instead of sitting there and watching, we ushered. Yeah. I learned a lot about ushering. Christina, I learned a lot about ushering, right? So I, you, know, you should bring me back, and I'll coach the ushers. I mean, they do fantastic. They do fantastic. But anyway, lots and lots of fun we've been having. Awesome. So during that time, lots of traveling, lots of fun, taking a break. But, but also, this is the first time you haven't been a lead pastor, 36 years. And you mentioned to us that this would be a season of discovery and uh, asking a lot of questions, letting God speak to you. Give us part of that journey behind all the travel uh, about what God's been doing in your life. Well, there are certainly questions that come up, right? One first first question was hitting me before I left was, can we afford this? Like, I don't I don't know. You you know you you get it all planned out, and then who knows what, right? So that's kind of weird. And then uh, and then Donna and I, part of what we did over these last six months, we, we went church adventuring. So we visited other churches around the region, and you know we were in Hawaii. We went to church. We were in uh, wherever else we were, we went to church. <laughs> and I'm old. I forget stuff now. Um, but in all those places, like, wow, they look at, they do it different here. You know, I'm like, we, we, we did it like we always did it, and then now they do it different. So we're learning all those kinds of things. But one of the questions that comes up through all of that is, you know, what if you're not the lead pastor anymore? What if you're not a pastor anymore? What if you're not like, Pastor Brad? You know, like, what if, what if that's not even true if it goes away, right? And can you, can you handle that? And uh, it's been a very interesting journey just walking with the Lord through that kind of thing because uh, I thought before I retired that this was true, and I th I'm uh, convinced it is true at this point. Pastor Brad is not my identity. <clears throat> pastor Brad is a, it's a it's a thing that I've done and I'm a pastor you can't get the pastor out of me I've st still been doing pastoral things 
I've officiated some memorial services over the last six months. Uh, I have, you know, pe- I come across people and there's a need and I'm praying for people. So I'm, I'm doing pastoral things, but I'm not Pastor Brad. I'm not on the front. I'm not up front all the time at all. So, and what I've really learned is I'm okay with anonymous. I'm okay and not anonymous because I'm a, I'm not primarily Pastor Brad. I'm, pi- I'm primarily a child of God. And I'm a husband. Yeah, right? That's who we are. I'm a husband to my beautiful wife who said goodbye to me after the first gathering. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not staying for two. I don't have to. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, a, I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a, I'm a grandfather, and, and I'm a child of God. That's my, that's my biggest thing. The other thing, here's another, if I can... If I can just keep going, yeah, go for it. Uh, you tell me when to stop. Uh, one of the one of the questions going into this thing is like, what's this transition really going to be like? You know, I I went into the whole process of looking for my successor, like not knowing what it's going to be like, and there's there's quite a bit of like anxiety that goes with that. Like, is it going to work? And then before we actually made that baseball handoff, you know, I knew Brian well enough by that point to be really really comfortable. But now, just watching, and you know, we watch online uh, when we're not out traveling and looking at other churches and being with them, uh, and I hear from you, and st- I'm just, uh, I have zero level of anxiety about this man leading us. That wasn't on the script, Brad. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, yeah. You, you, most of you know me well enough. It's like I don't, I don't cover it up very well anyway. So I would, I wouldn't be able to tell them, I like this guy. No, I not only l- love Brian, but I trust him. I trust him. Uh, we get to hear him give God's word today, and I trust him to give it to us and straight and with toe touches and you know, like <laughs> amazing. That's pretty things. good. That's pretty good. So, <laughs> yeah, I can do it when I'm sitting yeah, down. That's right. You do it standing up, man. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so um, you've, you've had this six-month break, did some traveling, God's speaking to you, showing you some things, but we know the story's not over. It's just a chapter, so there's a new chapter, and you're about to really uh, firsthand experience this. Let us know what's next for you and how we can be praying for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the things I've actually been working on in my retirement is this thing called Church Hope. We have actually launched a ministry called Church Hope, and the idea is... Uh, I am going out, and I've got some other pastors who are enlisting to do this also when the, when the number grows, but uh, I'm going out with Donna, and I will serve at, in a pastoral role when a church wants to give their pastor a sabbatical, but they go, we can't really make the arrangements work, or we can't, we can't finance it, or whatever those things are. We go out, and we just volunteer to be the pastor uh, in that community and in that church while the pastor takes a break and gets a rest. It's so good. So uh, I've been working on that and trying to get the word out and things like that. Well, actually, this Tuesday, two days from now, Don and I are getting in our truck and we're pulling our trailer across the country to Lake Crystal, Minnesota. Oh Min- Minnesota. And uh, I don't know if I'm doing that right. I've been practicing. I don't, we'll see. And uh, anyway, we're going to this little church in rural Minnesota and the pastor's taking a break. Uh, Uh, And we're going to come in, and the whole goal is to encourage the church, encourage the pastor, cheerlead for the pastor, uh, and and hopefully leave them in better shape even than they were when we got there. Now, this church, this church we're going to, this first one, it's not like the pastor's planned sabbatical for like three years, like, oh, good, you're here, you're good, you know. This one's a little rough situation. I can't give you the details of it, but there's some really significant challenges that they face as a church, and if you would just remember to pray for those challenges and for me and for Donna even to be able to speak into those or to listen to people, to pray for people, to care for people uh, in the journey that they're on uh, with Christ there. That would be great. Absolutely. Can I, can I, are you going to yes. get me into that? <laughs> what else, Brad? What else? Oh, good. <laughs> hey, that's a good question. Sorry, I'm not used to being on this end, the receiving end of an interview. <laughs> uh, I want to give you my church, my church hope website. If you want to follow along with what we're doing, I'm updating people on our website. It's not so much going on social media, a little bit, but on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter, and it's just going to update you in terms of where we are and what we're doing. So the, the church, or the website is churchhope.net. 
churchhope.net. If you forget that, you can call the office this week or whatever, and uh, you guys will get people set up with that. But go on there, and you can find, you know, ask for the newsletter, and we'll get that to you. So love that. So good. So we're going we're gonna to start now. We're going to pray right now for Brad as a church congregation. We're supporting Brad and Donna in this, this trip and this ministry that they're a part of, and then continue. And then when he's not uh, out and about um, amongst the, the different states, and it's going to be so cold. We're going to get warm. You're going to get cold. I'm sorry about that. I'm buying fleece. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when he's back in town, he's going to be in church, and, and he might be sitting next to you. So, um, you know, who knows where, where your new seat will be? Maybe a variety of places, it probably yeah. wherever Donna that's wants exactly to sit. Where yeah, it's that's, that's be. exactly right. Right. If you but, find Donna in church here, you'll find me. But right it's a great opportunity. And again, we all have different church backgrounds. Some of us have no church background. But this isn't always the case where we get to have this transition, still be a part of the church, still have friendship. It's a beautiful picture of what I think God wants but isn't always happening. And so we want to just continue uh, to um, have a great relationship, provide opportunity because this is your church home. So we want to support Thank you. Thank you. Way. Okay. We're going to pray. If you would, would you just reach out your hand and uh, let's pray for Brad, Donna, and for this ministry. Lord, thank you for Brad and Donna. Thank you for who they are. Thank you for their heart. Thank you for their desire to continue to care, uh, specifically with Church Hope in uh, providing pastors a break and the ability to get away and to rest and to receive um, just the peace that you bring. So Lord, on this first trip, we pray you'd go before them, that you'd bless them, that you'd prepare the hearts of the people. God, let it be a, a meaningful time. Let there be ministry and healing and goodness. We thank you, God, that you're with them. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's give it up one more time, Brad. Appreciate you. Okay. Good job. Okay. Well done. All right. We do have a message. Are you okay with that today? Yes or no? I'm going to do it anyways. All right, here we go. Uh, we have a series that's uh, kicking off today that's really a post-Easter, on purpose, a post-Easter series, and we're calling it Made for More, Made for More. And it's this reality, kind of Easter is such a big deal, and it should be, and we should celebrate, and we should do toe touches, Brad. Not, I'm not, I'm not uh, that agile, but, but we should. We should absolutely make the most of this celebration of an empty tomb. Uh, and we celebrate because Jesus is alive, right? Where Jesus is alive, we should celebrate. Last week, I talked about this in the message. There's no more gap. That means that not only is Jesus alive, but access is granted. You and I can have access to God. He has an urgency to be connected with us, which is so great. And we should do so much celebration. But here's the dilemma. The dilemma is that I still have issues. Come on, somebody. Right? Like, like Jesus is alive, access is granted, I still have issues. And sometimes there can be like this after Easter, post Easter, kind of like, Whoa, what's going on? Because you go back home and you find yourself cranky still and, and you're like kind of worried about this and you don't know about that and you're like, wait a second, Jesus is alive, access is granted, why do I still have issues? And here's the reality. I think all of us would love for Jesus to be alive, access is granted, and shazam, all things are good, right? Come on, somebody. Like, you just, you just get that shazam going on, and all of a sudden you're like, ba -ba, and you're like, I look right, I see right, I talk right, I make all the right decisions, I'm not afraid of anything, I'm just good to go. The problem is that's not how it works. Come on. And if we're not careful, a lot of us, when we're, when we're not making jokes, when we're like, when it's really hard, we begin to ask ourselves questions like maybe, maybe this, I'm just not cut out for this. Maybe Jesus is alive, maybe access is granted, but um, it didn't take, you know, like I, I, I must have, I must have missed something. And a lot of doubt, a lot of worry, a lot of wondering, and, and, and maybe it doesn't mean that we just walk entirely away from God, but it can mean that we just kind of live this life that is not in the fullness of what God wants for us. Because yes, yes, the grave is empty, but man, we still have issues. But here's the good news and the reason why we're doing this series. When we look at the scriptures, 
on that Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead, but he did not immediately ascend to heaven and say, good luck, everybody. I hope you figure it out. There was actually this 50-day period between the Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost Sunday, these 50 days, and on the church calendar, it's known as Easter Tide. And it's actually, this is kind of cool. Uh, some of you didn't know this. It's actually 50 days of Easter, 50 days of celebrating the resurrection. I think, you know, like, I, I don't know how we can pull out 50 Sundays here, just like Easter Sunday. Um, but there is this, this moment and this time that is a very important uh, time for us. Because rather than just ascend to heaven, Jesus stuck around until he understood, until we understood and the stories that we look at in these 50 days where he showed up in people's lives, where there was a mess, where there were issues. Yes, Jesus was alive, but they were still trying to figure things out. And he revealed himself and he ministered and showed them there. Yes, the grave is empty. You still have issues, but I'm here to let you know you were made for more than this. And so he addressed people's questions. He addressed people's confusion. He addressed people's issues. Because Jesus shows us in this, this 50-day period that he wants to be present, that he doesn't want to be distant. It shouldn't just be a theology where you're like, I believe Jesus is alive, but he's not near to me. No, we see in this portion of the scripture these stories that exist during these 50 days that we'll dive in deeper, that God wants to be very present with us. Some of these issues that people are experiencing, let's look at a list of them. In John 20, we see that people are dealing with fear. People are dealing with doubt, shame, confusion, wounds from the past. People are dealing with this sense of inability, uh, incapable of moving forward. And Jesus shows up during these 50 days, addresses these issues and says, listen, I'm alive, but I have something for you. You are made for more than this. Don't you dare settle for a life that just believes in a risen Savior, but just experiences this kind of life because you are made for more than this. In fact, we pulled this, this title, Made for More, from this theme song. We're going to sing this song at the end of the service. We sang it last week at Easter, and I want to just show you a few lines from the, the lyrics of the song where it says, I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was called by, by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. And I just love this line. I'd sing it to you, but then you guys would go like this, and it's not good. Josh should sing it. Uh, I shouldn't. But, but this first line, I wasn't made to be tending a grave. And this is what Jesus did when he showed up in people's lives. They, they believed that Jesus was alive, but they were still experienced this, this shame, guilt, fear. And he's like, don't tend this grave. You, you don't have to live this way. And he showed up in their life, and he says, I'm going to show you that you were made for more. I'm calling you, calling you forward. And here's my, here's my concern as a pastor. This is why we're doing this series. Some people have a, a poor theology that kind of thinks about heaven as heaven later. Like, heaven someday, until then, we just got to hold on and just kind of make it through. Like, come on, Margaret, we're just going to make it till, till the end. But someday, you know, glory's coming, and, but until the, and, and you just kind of tend to grave until heaven comes later. But what Jesus reveals to us, it's not just heaven later, it's heaven now. It's the kingdom of God here. It's experiencing the goodness of God here and now, letting God's kingdom be alive in you so that you don't tend graves of old because you were made for more. May we not just sit around waiting for something that can be experienced in the here and now. Amen, somebody. In fact, Jesus would explain this. He'd explain this. In fact, in Luke chapter 17, it, it says this. One day, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. He's saying, I'm, I brought heaven to earth. If you remember where the disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He said, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus made it possible to experience the goodness of God, the kingdom of God, so that we're not just tending graves, just kind of making it through until one day at least we go to heaven. And on Easter, I, I'm concerned that some people are like, I just want to go to heaven, so just tell me how to go to heaven because I want to go to heaven. And, and you're like, okay, I guess I'm going to heaven now. And then you go back to your old life. But that is not 
following Jesus. When you follow Jesus, you experience the kingdom of God. Jen Jarvis, our kids pastor, talked about Blitz and how the theme is the kingdom, the kingdom here, the kingdom now, the kingdom of God. Our kids this summer will be learning about this, but let's get a head start. Understanding kingdom here, heaven here, made for more. And I love this simple explanation of on earth as it is in heaven. Here's, here's a simple definition or, or understanding of the kingdom of heaven. It's the order of heaven coming against the chaos on earth. Jesus came to bring the order of heaven in the midst of the chaos of earth. So anywhere Jesus went, he's like, wait a second, sickness? Sickness is chaos of theirs. That doesn't belong in heaven. I'm bringing the order of heaven. I'm bringing, I'm bringing healing. Wait, fear? No, fear doesn't belong in heaven. That's the chaos of this earth. I'm here to bring peace where there's fear. Wait, there's shame over here. Shame doesn't belong. That's the chaos of this earth. I'm here to bring, I'm here to bring peace. I'm here to bring wholeness. Jesus brought the kingdom here. You and I can experience day by day, step by step, understanding by understanding more of what God has because he wants you to know you were made for more. It's not just to get to heaven. It's to experience heaven starting now, and he wants to do that in you, and he wants to do that through you. He wants you to experience the kingdom of God in your life. He wants you to bring the kingdom of God to our community through your life. And Jesus gives us the example during these 50 days. Let's go back to our list. Where Jesus encounters fear, we're going to see how Jesus brought order. He brought courage. Where there was doubt, he brings belief. Where there was shame, he brought dignity. Where there was confusion, he brought purpose. Where there were past wounds, he brought healing. Where there was inability, he brought power. Jesus says, I, I'm going to bring the order of heaven against the chaos of earth. And as you experience this, you won't have to wait to get to heaven. You will begin to experience heaven in the here and now. You were made for more. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, each week, we're going to look at one of these stories. How Jesus showed up after Easter, but before he ascended, and how he brought the kingdom of heaven. How he showed and revealed this reality. Yes, the grave is empty, but yes, you have issues. Don't worry, I'm going to help you out. So the first thing we're going to look at is this fear that Jesus encounters in his own people in John chapter 20. Let's look at how this scripture starts. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting. Now here's the context. That Sunday evening is literally Easter evening. Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. Here's the context. Mary goes to, to take care of Jesus' body because the, the, the dudes, the men, had buried, the, had buried Jesus in the tomb. But Mary goes back because she's like, I know they didn't do a good job. Uh, I got I to gotta fix what they tried to do. So, so she goes back, and, she, and, and the, the tomb is empty. She's like, what? Oh, my goodness, what? Oh, my goodness, what? And then this gardener, I'm putting it in quotations because she thought it was a gardener, shows up, and, and she's like, what's going on? She's like, the, the body's gone, ma. What, what, what? And then this gardener says her name, Mary. And when he says Mary, she looks at him and she realizes this is the risen Savior. This is Jesus. And she encounters the living Savior. And so she runs back to tell the fellas. And she runs back over here. And they're like, what? She's like, I know. And they're like, what? She's like, I know. And she's like, what? I can't. And, and then uh, you can read this for yourself. You should read the Bible. Uh, and then... And <laughs> Peter and John have a foot race. Literally, John writes about this. In fact, John's kind of funny about this. John really likes John. Like, he, he speaks well of himself in his own gospel writings. He, he's like, there was a foot race, and John, the beloved, beat Peter to the tomb. He literally writes that. Nobody else in the account of this writes about John beating Peter, but John writes about John beating Peter. By the way, this is just extra credit. John also, in his own gospel calls himself the beloved nobody else calls John the beloved he's like the one whom Jesus loved people are like come on John remember Jesus is alive we have access but we all have issues so so they go back and they're like the grave's empty what 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 so they run back the grave's empty oh my goodness meanwhile another some guys are walking back to Emmaus huh. if you went to the men's breakfast I preached about this but uh, the, these guys are walking back to Emmaus because Jesus must be dead nothing worked out H shoulders are hunched over and then Jesus shows up but they don't know he's Jesus so he's like hey what are you guys doing what's going on and they're like you don't know where have you been he's like well that's another 
other story. But, but they're like, they're like Jesus. We thought he's the Messiah, but, but he's like, okay. Uh, and then he goes on, go, goes to go on, and they're like, no, stay with lunch. And he breaks bread just like the Last Supper, but it wasn't the Last Supper because he's still doing because he's alive. And he breaks bread, and it says when he did it, their eyes were open, and they realize it's Jesus. And later on, they would say, did not our hearts burn within us? when he spoke to us and they realized Jesus was alive. They run back and they tell the disciples, so this is all on Easter. This is all Easter Sunday. This is why it's a big deal. But now we get to Easter evening and all these people with all this stuff has gone on and they're meeting together and you might be thinking, it must be a party. They must be like, Jesus alive, rock and roll. Like, it's just like, let's go. But that's not at all what they're doing. Look at what, how the scripture continues. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Yes, Jesus was alive. Yes, access had been granted, but they still had issues. They had very re real issues. They had very legitimate fears. There was real threats. This wasn't like, oh, you should have faith, you know, and sometimes people console you like, like what you're going through shouldn't be that big of a deal, and you like, you don't know. You don't know what I'm facing. And sometimes people mean well, but they just don't know well, and so they don't comfort well. Come on, somebody. I mean, I don't raise your hand, but, like, that, that's just rough. But these guys, these guys are experiencing legitimate fear, real issues in a real world, even with a risen Savior, real fears, fears of humiliation, of rejection, persecution. They had killed Jesus. Now is he alive? We don't know. Like, we're trying to figure this out. But are they just going to keep killing? Like, we're next. And so here they are, huddled up in fear because of these Jewish leaders. What I love about this is that Jesus shows up in the midst of these fears. And he's not shocked. He's not angry. He's not like, why don't you have more faith? He just shows up. Look at what happens. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Now, this is a little trippy because they are behind locked doors. And it doesn't say Jesus knocked. It doesn't say that he, you know, pulled out his little MacGyver pickpocket. That's for all you 40-year-olds. Uh, and, and just pick, pick the lock. It, it, it just Jesus just appears. And, and we don't really know the why and all that. And we can, it's, it's interesting but if I could just propose a simple uh, suggestion, that a curtain, this is from the message last year, a curtain, a veil could not keep God from us, no gap. Locked doors could not keep Jesus from us, and fear could not keep Jesus from us. He is setting an example. You are going through some real things. You are trying to keep everybody out, but I'm inviting myself in. And sometimes... Sometimes Jesus just shows up in our life uninvited. Come on, somebody. Like sometimes we invite him, come, Lord Jesus, come. And then sometimes Jesus just shows up. We're like, whoa. And I think that's what these guys are like. They're like, whoa. And Jesus isn't rude. He's not a party crasher. He's not here to just take something from them. He's here to bring order to their chaos. The order of heaven to the chaos of the world. He recognizes it. He sees it. He understands it. But he's here to bring order to their chaos. And when everyone is afraid with their legitimate fears, look at what he does. He says this, peace be with you, he said. Jesus is alive, access is granted, but they still have issues and peace is still needed. And if you're thinking about your own spiritual journey and how you celebrated Easter, but maybe the problems that you walked back into on Monday, that's just called life. But the good news is, is that Jesus didn't say, well, I saved you, but good luck with your life. I'll see you when you get here. Jesus wants to enter into that world, into, into that space, and bring peace. And the good news is, when Jesus says peace, it's not just lip service. Again, some people bring their best intentions, but they can't really help you. They can't really bring you peace. They can bring you some, maybe some consolation, but Jesus brings peace, but with those words, he packs some meaning and some engagement that changes the trajectory of their lives. Look at what happens next. Verse 20. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hand and his side. 
They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. So Jesus doesn't just show up with lip, lip service, doesn't just say peace. He goes, look, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand that I have defeated sin and death. I, I, I'm not a ghost. I'm, I'm me. Like, you can see where they pierced me. I understand. And they're like, oh, I think he's alive. And he's like, okay, you're getting excited, but you're still kind of freaked out. So peace again. He goes, double dose of peace. But I love this next part. Because it says, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Where is he talking to them? He's talking to them in an enclosed place locked behind doors in fear. And Jesus is saying, this is no place for you. You were made for more. I'm sending you out beyond these locked doors. Your fears are legit. There's real threats out there. There's problems that will not go away just because we want them to go away. But you living paralyzed, locked behind your these locked doors, this is not the life for you. You were made for more. As the Father sent me with the order of heaven, I'm sending you. Yes, Jesus faced persecution. Yes, he faced. But he engaged in the purpose-filled life that God had for him, living this life rather than cowering away behind locked doors. And Jesus says, and I am here to bring you through. And I'm here to bring you a double dose of peace if that's what you need. And you might think at that moment, the disciples are like, sweet, yes. Like Jesus showed up. He bring us peace twice. He showed us his hands, his side. He's sending us out. Thanks, Jesus. Let's go, fellas. And, you know, let the, and there it is. Like, let's go get some burritos or whatever. Like, like you might think that that's exactly what Jesus needs. Jesus will speak to you. And, and once he does, it's fine. Case closed. Moving on. That's not what happened. In fact, um, John is not the only one who wrote the account of this interaction. Luke also records it. Look at what happens after Jesus does this. Luke records it this way. Still, they stood there in disbelief with joy, filled with joy and wonder. This right here is called all the feels right here. They, they didn't go. They weren't like, okay, Jesus is sending us. Let's go. No, they're still, still there. They're in disbelief, but now they've got this mixture of emotions of joy and wonder. It's probably like this, ah, oh, hey, oh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know, but like, this is all trippy, and it's kind of good news, but uh, out there is still kind of scary, but Jesus is with us, but we're not going yet. And so there's some disbelief. There's some joy. There, there's some wonder, but try to, try to put yourself there. Like Peter's there. Peter is viewing Jesus, the Jesus he just denied three days ago. The one he's like, I don't even know of who you speak of to save his own skin. And now he's face to face with the one he denied. All the feels. I don't know if he was like, hey, Jesus, you got a moment? Can we talk about Friday real quick? Like, hey, just, let's just, uh, um, you know, it's a bad day, you know. The chopping the ear thing, my bad. Like, I just, I don't, we don't know. But we get it. Come on. Just like if I'm not careful, if, if we're trite with preaching and messages, we never want to feel like, oh, just kind of do this and go live your life, and you're going to live the abundant life that God has for you. You sitting there like, do you know my life? Do you know what I'm facing? The good news is Jesus does. And we get a real reaction from people that are like, I want to believe. I kind of do believe. I, 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 I'm, I'm just still trying to figure it out. And I don't know if this next part is funny or not, but I find it kind of comical because in the midst of all these emotions, they're not going where, going anywhere. So I guess Jesus is like, fine. Uh, look what happens. Verse 42. Then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Like, what? Like, like oh, I don't know. He's like, I'm sending you. Let's go. And they're like, ah. Oh. He's like, cool. I'm hungry. Do you have some food? And they're like, oh. And they give him some fish. And like, you know how awkward it is when someone watches you eat something? You know, you're just like, no. Like, I have this thing with bananas. I love bananas. I eat bananas all the time. I hate, 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 loathe entirely watching someone eat a banana. Come on, somebody. 
You know, like someone's just talking. Like, but these guys, they're all in. They're like, ooh. I mean, Jesus eating this piece of fish. And sure, I, I, I get it, and you probably get it as well. He's probably proving, like, I am, I am fully flesh. I'm not a ghost. This is some, some uh, confidence that I'm bringing to you. You have peace. I'm like, we'll get there. We'll go step by step, right? But Jesus is like, I do want you to get the full picture. And so next, we're going to go into this portion of Scripture, what happens after apparently he's done eating and they're done watching. Jesus takes them farther because he wants the fullness of peace to enter their life in the fear that they're finding behind these locked doors. Look at what happens in verse 44. It says this, Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witness of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Jesus wants them to understand that there is a life for them beyond the locked doors that the, that the fear finds them in. Jesus could have just ascended to heaven. Jesus could have died on the cross, paid the price, ascended to heaven, said, I did my part. You guys are on your own. But he knew that you and I were not meant to be tending a grave. And so he shows up, gives us an example of coming close, experiencing the presence of God, but also the teachings of God. And he reveals the scriptures and shows them you have a life. You're witnesses of this. There is something beyond these doors for you. There is a life for you to be lived. But you don't have to do it on your own because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and will fill you with power. You are not meant to be tending a grave. So really quick, three things that Jesus shows us through this portion of Scripture. The first is that Jesus rejects the locked door life associated with fear. He doesn't even address the locks in the room. He doesn't say, why did you lock me out? He didn't say, why are there locks on the doors? He gets it. He just rejects it. He's like, I get it. You have legitimate fears, but I am call I, there is a life beyond the fears that you're experiencing. There is a life for you, and I'm going to reject it. Reject those locked doors in your life. Secondly, is this. Jesus teaches the scriptures to reveal the kingdom of God. He understands that when life happens, we get all the feels. Some good, some bad, some in between. And if we live our life just based off of our feelings, man, we can just go in a million different directions and end up nowhere. But Jesus is like, root yourself in the scriptures. Let me teach you. Let me open your minds to the story of God. This is important for you. If you're going to have peace, get rooted in the scriptures. Jesus gave that example. And third is this. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to empower us beyond locked doors to a God-ordained life. He doesn't pre pretend that we should just like muscle up, that we shouldn't just like give it the good old college try, that we shouldn't look ourselves in the mirror and do some positive thinking. He knows that we will all experience fear, and he knows that there will be all different types of people offering all sorts of help for the fears that we face. Just go to Barnes & Noble in the Palladio, and you can read books about what people want you to do with the fears that you experience. And he goes, I get it. There's lots of, some, a lot of self-help out there some techniques you can use. But he's like, I have something for you that you can never do for yourself. I want to empower you beyond what you're capable of. I want to bring heaven to earth. I want to bring the order of heaven to the chaos of this earth, and I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to empower you. So, this is us. You and I experienced Easter. We celebrated in one way, shape, or form. Most of us in this room believe that Jesus is alive. Most of us have no apology to celebrate that, and we do with all of our heart, entirely leaning in to all that Easter is. Jesus is alive. Access is granted. It's just that the problem is, is that you and I still have issues. And so we have an option. 
we can hunker down and lock some doors in our life and just hold on until that day, or we can allow Jesus into those locked doors, into those places of fear, into those compartments, the closets that we haven't given into because they've, they've held us back, they've locked us down, they've chained us up. And the reality is you and I can have great lives with great families, love the city that we're in, have a job that you enjoy, all those types of things, and still be paralyzed in some categories of your life still have some things that, that just lock you down and shut you down, and you're like, don't go there. Don't ask me about her. I don't want to talk about that. That subject is off limits because you have something that you're like, I just think that the best way for me to make it through is just to hold on. And Jesus is saying, you were made for more than that. You don't have to live that way. I'll enter into that space, and I won't be angry. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not, not going to ask you all these questions. I just want to meet you where you are. And I want to call you forward. So as we wrap up this message, I want to invite the band to come on forward because I want us to do some of that inventory. If Jesus is alive, access has been granted, but we have issues. Here, here's a question for all of us to hold on to, and it's simply this. What doors have you locked in your life? Whether you believe or don't believe in Jesus, the whole point of this message is almost all of us believe and we still lock some doors. Maybe it's relational. Maybe there's just something where there's just a grudge that you've held on to and you're afraid that if you ever forgive that person, it's like you're, you're giving some kind of pass to them for what they did and so you're just afraid to forgive. Maybe it's financial. You're just, you're just so afraid of your financial state. You don't even want to look at your bank account. You certainly don't want to give generously because you're just afraid of what might happen. Do you know the state of the world? Maybe it's like political, and you're just like, do you know where we're at? Do you know what's going on in this world? Do you know? And you're just paralyzed by fear, and you've locked up some doors. Jesus gets it, and some of those fears are legit. Let me tell you what most pastors don't want to tell you about this story, okay? These guys that were afraid of persecution, almost all of them died by persecution. Their fears happened. Like they, they were persecuted. They died. Please hear me. This is not the church. If you just want us to pretend like life will be fine, if you just trust in Jesus, everything's up and to the right, and health and wealth and all the other kind of good things, that's not this church because that's not this life. But those disciples, they ended up dying. We're all going to die. Newsflash, right? They died, but they did not die behind locked doors. They did not die shut down, cowering, just holding on to the end. They lived, and they made a difference, and they brought the order of heaven because the order of heaven entered in them and through them, and they preached the message boldly, and they no longer allowed fear to keep them from the very life God had destined for them. I cannot promise you that if you just put your trust in Jesus, all your fears will go away. None of that will ever happen. You'll be fine. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says that even if you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear any evil because God is with us. This is what God wants to do. The Apostle Paul knew this when he was commissioning Timothy to go be a pastor and to, to go into the unknowns in some hostile environments. He's, he wrote this letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says this, Therefore, I remind you, Timothy, to stir up the gift of God which is in you, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He's like, Timothy, listen, guess what God gave you? He gave you the spirit. Come on. A, he gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, not a spirit of fear. But Timothy, you got to activate that bad boy. You got to stir it up. It doesn't matter if you have a theology. Well, I don't believe that God wants to give us. Okay, you got to stir that up. You got to activate that. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to follow Jesus' example. Number one, look, this is just what Jesus did. Well, you and I, just like Jesus rejected, we're going to reject the locked door life associated with fear. Uh-uh. Every time you want to cower down, hold on, anchor in, just kind of, nope, I reject that. That's not how I'm going to live. This is not what Jesus has for me. I refuse to live that kind of life. It starts with the resolve to reject the locked door life. Number two, this is what we're going to do. We're going to study the scriptures. We're not just going to be theology light. We're going to lean into, we're going to understand the story of God. We're going to understand how bad things can happen to good people, and God can use it, and in the mystery of it, and in the pain of it, God will get the glory, and will be shaped and formed for the kingdom to come. We're going to lean in because our theology is going to be leaning into the scriptures, rooted like a tree, so that even when those winds and waves come, and all those analogies, we are going to stand firm. This is what we're going to do. This is what brings peace to our hearts. Number three, we're going to rely on the promised Holy Spirit to give us courage and direction. I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again, I was made for more. (laughs) Yeah. There's there's a little bit, this is what faith does. It doesn't make you cocky. It makes you confident, not in yourself, because those fears are legit. It just allows you to stir this up and to believe for more than what you've locked yourself into. So as a church, we're going to sing this song to close it out. This can be an anthem for the next few weeks for us to hold on to. Before we do that, I want to give you a simple prayer for us to say together. And I'll say this out loud first, and we can say it together. Maybe you want to take a screenshot of this, and every morning you're just going to say this simple prayer. It goes something like this. Jesus, you are welcome behind the locked doors of my life. I receive your peace and promised Holy Spirit. Can we all say that together, not just out of ritual, but out of a heartfelt prayer, let's say this together. Jesus, you are welcome behind the locked doors of my life. I receive your peace and your promised Holy Spirit. Let's be people who don't pretend that fear doesn't exist. It does. It's real. It's legit. Let's just allow Jesus into the very space of where that fear has been. Let's allow him to call us forward into the light he has for us. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing this song, and we'll dismiss when the song is over.